So we had Low Web 2013, yes. and uh, you had a really cool presentation. What were you talking about? Um, I was well. The theme of the, the web has been um, ten years of the past, ten years of the future. Even though it's actually been eight years, um, it's been ten webs. And so I took that seriously and thought about what the web was like back in um, 2003, which was the time that I left Apple and, and started doing web development full time at Technorati, um, and followed that through to today. And, the, and there's at the time back in 2013, there was. Um, open source software on the server side that was creating all the development, but the client side was all um, IE6 and the, the, the third party browsers had been squeezed out. But the germ of the, the transition was there in that the, the Firefox and WebKit projects had started and um, the, the project that became HTML5 was then called WhatWG was kindled around the same time, which meant that the, the the open standards that founded the web 20 years ago was, were, were re rekindled 10 years ago. And that, um, that also led to browsers on um, devices, browsers on Android and iOS, um, and to Chrome, um, which means that the browser ecosystem now is completely different from what we had 10 years ago. You can develop something, um, you have a whole bunch of new features you can use. It's not just text anymore. It's SVG and video and sound and device access and all kinds of stuff that's being baked into the platform and translated between the platforms. So that piece has been solved. The difficulty is that now we have um, an analogous situation where we had lots of these different websites that we use for social publishing, things like that, social networks for blogging, some of that, that have now been subsumed into similar large silos of, of, of Facebook and Twitter and maybe a few others. Um, so the, the challenge we've got now for the next 10 years is to do the same thing that we did 10 years ago with WG and do it with the social staff. Um, and that's what the indie web ideas are about. The idea of the indie web is to say, let's make things that we can use for ourselves that um, don't try and replace these, these large things directly, but build infrastructure where they can, they can be composable, where you can swap pieces out. But you still can feed stuff back into Facebook so your friends who are on Facebook can read it. They don't have to sign up to your site. Um, so, so basically, you, you were the only one doing a presentation based on what people have asked. <laughs> last 10 years and next 10 years, kind of? Um, oh, everybody mentioned it, but they were, they were all talking about other specific things. Whereas I, I saw that theme and I thought, this is something I've been thinking about a lot. I've been thinking about the direction of the web. I mean, I've had the, had the opportunity to do that while I was at Salesforce, thinking about web standards and things like that. And now I've left Salesforce and I'm interested to make something again as a, as a, as a startup. Um, bu building it on these indie web principles is really important. So th this was a way for me to express the, the ideas that's, that's, uh, that have been bubbling under my mind for the last you know, six months. So totally by random, while I was in Shenzhen last night, and there was a W3C kind of meeting, I yes. think it's annual. The, and uh, the, are the they doing a lot of work? Are they doing enough work? Or is it good enough organization? Is it fast enough? Because this is super important, no? So we're in a better state now than we were, were 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, the W3C had basically said, OK, HTML is over, everything will be XML, all the browsers will have to change, and we're a legislative body. And the WhatWG was built by the people who were making browsers saying, wait a minute, that's not actually what we want. What we want is the ability to build applications and these things, how do we get about doing that? Um, and so there's been a, a transition in, in um, W3C, which has been based on, on the people who boot in that group. And so now the, 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 the TAG at W3C is thinking about these issues fairly strongly and has a, a much broader representation than it had 10 years ago. So they're moving in the right direction and they're starting to change the way that browsers are constructed. Um, and they're able to ratify things much more quickly because all the browsers now have dynamic update and the ability to add new features rapidly. Um, whereas, you know, we were stuck with IE6 for something like eight years. Um, before before updates could flow, so that 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 change of environment means that we can deploy new things, um, and the mode of deploying it has moved from competitive features um, as fighting each other to initial implementations that set the framework for the for the others to to agree with it. And there are places where that agreement hasn't fully converged yet, but the way that the, the TAG has moved has, means that that that's that thing's starting to happen. Today I was completely amazed over there. They were showing off uh, WebRTC, 4K peer-to-peer -peer video streaming. 
this is kind of like awesome. And yeah. does that mean that uh, because computers and ARM processors, but x86, everything is getting faster, so fast, does that mean that all that standardization needs to follow quickly also? And well, they need more features faster or what? So video has been problematic for forever because of patents. Um, so we're at the point now where those patents are actually expiring. That's one thing. So the, the, you know, the, the patents that have blocked up video with um, MPEG, basically what we, all that's happened with video codecs for, for the last 15 years is that they've just increased the frame size. It hasn't changed the algorithm much. Um, and we've been throwing more CPU at it and extra, extra chips because we've got more pixels, but the actual algorithm hasn't changed much because there's this like legacy pattern nightmare that means people have been And it's expiring for real, MPEG? All that um, stuff? The, yeah, well, all, well it, was, it was standardized almost 20 years ago. Yeah, bits of it were standardized 20 years ago, the bits of it have moved So they out. will not be able to block people from doing they MPEG 4 or all that? They will still try. MP3? But people are, you know, even, even the, the companies are, are frustrated enough. You know, Cisco have said, okay, we're going to freely, freely license, as in free, no money license our MPEG 4 stuff with a patent license so that people can ship it because we're sick of this nonsense going on. The other thing that's happened is that the development of the other subsystems has changed enough that it's possible to build a codec now in um, using JavaScript and WebGL. And people have demonstrated this. They've done implementations of H.264 and H.264 in them. But it also means that you can actually build a codec that is tuned to the particular content. And we can actually have some research in codecs again. So his, most of the codec algorithms we're using are still effectively two-dimensional. They're assuming that the image is composed of little squares and they move sideways and up and down and you, that's how you encode things. Whereas actually the real world is three-dimensional as you move the camera around me, it would be better to encode that as a, as a rotation rather than a two-dimensional move. Um, and that, that is now possible because we have the 3D graphics infrastructure for that and we have, the, um, we have much more content that's actually generated that way to begin with. So I expect to see this happen with things like um, videos of game footage, video of, mo of generated movie footage, things like that, that are initially 3D, um, being composed as a, as a stream of 3D objects, um, and then a codec that will take a, a natural scene and process that into that, being a, a secondary thing that can do that. So actually, filming in 3D makes a smaller 2D compression. Is that what it does also? Uh, potentially it could. What, what his, that hasn't been historically tackled, because um, there was a presumption that you had to make special custom hardware for it and the people who were making that had a very simple processing worldview. And because of the pattern, you know, it wasn't an area you could spend a lot of time doing innovation in except at the edges. So what we're now seeing is some changes in that. And part of it is just that the hardware has caught up. You know, the, 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 the ability to you know, have a HD screen you know, in a device this big um, and enough CPU to actually render it uh, 60 frames a second is, is, is pretty significant. And we're going to see more of that. Um, we are getting to the point, uh, we, we've had for a while, the, the Moore's Law has been moving in a different domain. It has been moving from making it faster and faster to making it smaller and lower power. Um, and that's the dividends we've seen with the, with, with the, the, the cell phone infrastructure. And that, that's still going on. But we may not have many generations more of that to go on. Um, but we'll, but we'll, you know, I expect us to see more of that, more distributed networking processing and things like that. So what do you think about Facebook? Do you think uh, the market is totally uh, uh, exploding, the bubble thing and all that stuff? Or what do you think? Just can I ask you? Um, I think... Twitter and all that stuff. You know, there, there's, there, there's still important subsystems for people, but they're not like the exciting growth thing they were. And this is, you know, it's just natural, things saturate. You go through exponential thing and you saturate like that. You know, Facebook, once Facebook had you know, half the people in the world, they couldn't double anymore. Um, and they're, they're at the point now where they are like, you know, I said they were like Yahoo was a decade ago. They're the place you go to by default to, to, to go to other places when you're not actually looking for something particularly. But it's not as exciting as five years ago. Um, five years ago, they were, they were a brand new thing. They were, they were different. Now they're understood, and what we're starting to see is these things are converging. We've had the you know, Instagram direct thing today, which is them saying, oh, well, there's this snapchat -y thing, and there's you know, the Twitter messenger, Facebook messenger. We're seeing these bits, like the feature sets are lining up because we, we found these patterns. We, you know, we found the pattern of the, the message with someone's face next to it being very important, and that was picked up by all of these things. The stream of events, the time-ordered stream that comes from blogging, but works as a, as a reading experience when they're associated with the faces, that, that's come through. And what we st we've started to see is the, 
um, the ability to do image primary communication because we have cameras everywhere and that can, that can be um, as easy or easier than sending text with these smaller devices. That's, that stuff is, is moving through. But it's not, um, it's not sort of groundbreaking, it's, it's, it's self-displacement. And that, that means, you know, for me that says we're in a, in a phase where we can say, okay, we understand that piece of it, we can, we can take a photograph and distribute that six different ways, um, but we can also keep that for ourselves as well. And it was interesting to see that one of the, the startups in the competition, um, which I forgot the name Social of, Safe. Social Safe was explicitly designed for you to um, gather all the stuff you fed into different social networks and put it onto your own computer so you can then use it for other things. But are they That's really allowed to, what you call, scrub or scrub or something, Twitter and Facebook? Um, well, can they access all the They've content? done it as a client app. So they've, rather than be a web service, uh -huh. they're a client app for each of them. Yeah. So for them, for the... For, this, you know, for the, the sites to yeah. revoke that, they're basically saying all client apps are evil. Yeah. They may go that way, they may end up feeling they have to go that way. They've done it to each other enough times now. One of the things that, that's been worrying about the last you know, three years has been watching these different silos um, stop interoperating by, because they're fighting with each other. And that, 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 that's been worrying for me, because that says that these things are going to fragment um, and it will be harder for us to build these things a bridge between them. But isn't uh, the social graph totally worthless? I mean, that's the way I look at it. Is it uh, like it's not worth that much? It's not worth 120 billion. If Facebook is worth 120 billion, it shouldn't be because they have just the connections. They know who is who and stuff. Um, the social graph isn't worth it. The social graph is a valuable filter. You know, that's that, that's still true. You know, that that still makes you know, if you if you're trying to make sense of the information in the world, filtering it through people is is useful. But it's not worth 120 billion, right? I mean, you can easily clone it, kind of. You can, you can't. I mean, you know, people, people have tried. Google's got there to some extent. Um, Twitter's got a parallel one, but um, but these things also, you know, they gather dust. Maintaining these, these things is hard, and it's often easier to go to a new system and pick the subset of people you want to use that system with um, from that graph, rather than. Um, filter down the, the existing set within the, within the large group. I'd like to export my social graph in social safe and then uh, import and then export another social network. Uh, that's, yeah, that. that's doable. But yeah. you know, the, the, the challenge you have is you've got to do identity binding between the groups. So you've got to say this person here is that person there. Um, and we've had ways, to, in the web way, we've had ways to do that for, for you know, a decade with Realm E, um, where you just link to yourself and say, this is me, this is also me. Um, and you know, bits of the web have been built on that. Google, um, Google still does that fairly well. They use that to, to correlate pieces. Um, but this, the challenge, and we are starting to see this with the multiple sign-on thing. So you, you build an app and it offers Google sign-on or Facebook sign-on or Twitter sign-on. In effect, that's, that's letting you say, I'm this person on both places um, and lets you distribute the stuff between them. The, but the, the, the challenge is, understanding the context that you want to use in those things um, and not falling prey to the temptation to try and grow your startup by sending it out to everyone you know. And I've you know, been worrying signs. When Path started doing that, that was worrying. Um, LinkedIn has started um, making it very hard for you not to click on the upload your address book button. Um, and also they've done the, this dodgy thing of it used to be they would show you new invitations at the top. They now show you suggested people to invite at the top in the same UX as the new invitations used to look. So lots of invitations are being sent by accident. So they're actually diluting their own graph in, while they think they're expanding it. And I'm, I'm seeing so much spam from these social networks. Twitter, LinkedIn, they're all sending more and more emails saying, hey, do you want to, do you want to, and I have to unsubscribe. Yes, no, well, that, you know, that, that, that's always an issue. They, they have classically used, all, all, the, all, the, all that generation of them have classically used email as the acquisition tool. Um, the chap, who, whose name I can't remember, showed a graph of how you spread your app virally and you had this big spike in it five years ago and that was when those were ramping up. So they still think that way. Um, what they're coming to terms with is that um, email is not a strong acquisition tool on the, on the mobile phone. Um, there are other things and they're starting to try and fish your address book, your, your SMS groups, the other ways you communicate with each other or to build these overlays on them like, you know, like iMessage, like Snapchat, like um, whatever the Google one's called. Um, where they say, okay, we'll, we'll send this through SMS, we'll also bridge our other thing on top, um, and you get a richer experience with the one that, that isn't SMS. 
Now, which is, you know, this is reasonable. That's basically what Twitter did. Twitter bootstrapped themselves off SMS um, with email as a secondary thing. So they were the first one to do that, and they built their network with the, within those constraints, and then they expanded to the web. So when they went to Rich Mobile, they already had a, an understanding of how that works. And we're starting to see that you know, fold back and make sense again. So the last question. Uh, do you think it can be said that Google Plus is kind of sadly a failure, kind of, because it should be much better? Or Because um, I, I think Google Plus is the best, but still, I want so much more than what they provide. And, uh, for example, it's just a bunch of random people circling random people and so random they've got, the, they've got the same they've got the same sort of problem. I mean, they've got the advantage that they have a set of rich internet properties that make sense that they can couple it with. Um, so they can they can attach it to YouTube, they can attach it to Blogger, they've got the email graph, they've got the stuff in-house. The drawback is that um, people don't think of Google in that way, and so it's hard to... You know, that people's mental model is no Facebook is my public space and Google is, is the place where I search and do email. Um, so it's hard for them to establish that. And that's still culturally difficult. Um, and yeah, the secondary piece is, it's like they're, they're trying really hard to get you into that mode when you try and do something else. Um, now, I, I, the, the debate over YouTube is, is interesting because you know, I remember having that debate five years ago when I was at Google saying, no, YouTube is really bad and social could improve it. The, the knowing who you know thing, the thing that Bradley said, is absolutely right. When you have something with lots of comments, you want that filter, um, and it becomes a ranking issue. Um, the challenge is, if you don't get the ranking filters right, you, you create another attack point. And so the transition is, is, is painful. I think that will end up being better, because I do think that um, having some sense of who's relationship is good, but there are some other structural problems in Google Plus that, that have been weak. You know, the, the names policy has been badly handled continuously and it's still a mess. Uh, it's mitigated a little bit, but it's still not right. Um, and some of the other... Um, the groups aren't really coherent enough. There's like three different concepts of group overlaid in there um, that are coherent on an engineering sense, but aren't coherent in a user experience sense. And that makes it hard for people to understand quite what's going on. I expect they'll iterate on that and get better at it, but it is, you're still asking people to do a very um, high cognitive load thing, which is subdivide everyone you know into useful groups for general purposes. Do you think Google's gonna win? Um, I'm, not, you know, I'm not sure Google's gonna win. I think Google, Google is gonna keep doing useful and interesting things. Uh, their challenge is gonna be can they maintain the flow of advertising money that is, is, can support them in their in their long-term plans, or are they going to get squeezed as, as these things change? Um, I think that their instincts are fairly good about building open tools that lots of people could reuse. This is, this is how we've got Android and Chrome. Um, and I think that the stuff they've done with mapping is a huge long-term investment in useful information that probably will outweigh the social stuff over time because actually knowing what, what is where and what, who is where is, is, a, is a very significant yeah, data set to, to build on. Cool, thanks a lot. And I'll link to your presentation just under this video.